So they say don't judge a book by its cover, and Weapon of Choice by Dr. Matthew Ford is an excellent example of why you should not judge a book by its cover. I'm Ian McCollum, thanks for tuning in to another book review on Forgotten Weapons. What we have here is really an academic thesis. I mean this thing, it's beyond the level of PhD thesis, but this is a seriously academic historical study. And it's been given a title and a cover image that makes it look like, honestly, like an airport thriller novel. And so what I would recommend, uh, US Navy SEAL on the front with that totally tacticaled out Scar H is pretty cool, but irrelevant uh, to the actual book. So I would say take the dust jacket and remove it. And now we can talk about this with an appropriate plain black cover, because this is a seriously academic book and there's a ton of fantastic information in it. Uh, if you are interested in firearms procurement by the military, I cannot recommend this highly enough. So what this book really is, is just that. It's a study of small arms procurement through the lens of the British military in the 20th century. And it's going to look at the, the questions of how do various guns get adopted? How do they go from concept to development to adoption and, and use through all the various different groups of people who have a stake in that sort of decision? So politicians, uh, army officers, army officials, army committees that are set up to, you know, to pick weapons versus actual troops on the field who are using them versus private industry that may be designing or developing or just producing small arms. All of these different groups have a hand in the development and adoption process. And what Ford does is really analyze how that whole system works. So the book is set up uh, chronologically. It's going to start with the Boer War and the adoption of the British adoption of the SMLE. And what was involved in that? Even, even that rifle is a very interesting change in British military policy in that it, it shows the, uh, it's the change from having infantry and cavalry rifles separate to having one standard universal rifle for all of the different branches of service. From there, it's going to look at uh, weapons development during World War I. Uh, probably the biggest single chunk of this is about the NATO, uh, post-World War II NATO standardization. Uh, in large part, the fight over 280 and the British EM-2 rifle versus uh, what became 7.62 NATO, the T-65 cartridge, in the American M14, the American T-65, and also the Belgian FAL. Uh, how that, there, there's so much information on that process. Um, and from a perspective that I have rarely seen anywhere else. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler. A big part of that was uh, cartridge lethality. So the, the whole basis of adopting a rifle cartridge is largely based on uh, what's going to actually be effective at killing a bad guy with a rifle bullet. And well, the commonly accepted standard was an American standard, and by accepting that standard, the British set themselves up to be playing on an uneven playing field, where they had to compete with a cartridge that was designed for one thing against an American standard that was pretty explicitly designed to favor something else. And in the long run, or in the short run really, we got 7.62 NATO for several decades. Uh, the book does go on, it discusses the development of the Enfield weapon system and SA-80, uh, and then it also actually talks substantially in one of the last chapters about British use of the FN Mini-Me, or in the US we would know it as the M249 saw, how that weapon replaced uh, the light support weapon, the SA-80 light support weapon. So what Ford is looking at here is this interplay of all the different groups you'd think Everyone involved has one common goal. It is to find the best weapon for the military, develop it in the most effective way possible, and presto, that's the goal. Well, in reality, everybody's got slightly different and sometimes competing goals. What the soldiers in the field want is not always what the officers in high command want, and neither of those may be the same thing as what the officers in a weapons selection committee are trying to find. Private industry may want something to be adopted because it's better from their perspective. All of these issues are the things that Weapon of Choice is discussing in depth. Now there are really two layers to this book. There is at one layer the history of all of these things that I've been discussing, and then at a, a somewhat deeper level Ford is also studying this on a, a very academic and sociological scale. To a point that, I'll be honest, often sounds like complete gibberish to me. Allow me to present one example. Let's see here. 
By rights, however, the approach should also call into question the very categories I have used to examine small arms development. Indeed, although notions of marksmanship, firepower, willpower, and stopping power are commonly recognized within shooter circles, as labels they define themselves, they are themselves reifications of complex socio-technical phenomena that in some ways mask the dynamic relations between weapon, engineer, and soldier. While deconstructing the underpinning ideas that frame these terms, I have stuck to the recognized linguistic conventions for the sake of advancing an accessible and not overly theorized arguments. argument. For STS scholars, however, the approach might smack too greatly of treating the social and the technology as in some ways separate, and that I am therefore reintroducing bifurcations or essentialist perspectives that do not do justice to the theory that has informed this study. So, if that made sense to you, you should immediately buy a copy of this book, because you will like it on all levels. If that couple of paragraphs sounded like gibberish, but you're very interested in the actual history of the adoption of the FAL, or the Lee Enfield Rifle, uh, or the Mini-Me, or the SA-80 program, you should also get a copy of this, and just recognize in advance that you're going to have to dig through some text like that. But I can assure you that the, the historical uh, veins of, of precious metals that run in this book are absolutely worth digging through some of that overly academic prose. Now, I freely admit that I do not have the, uh, the sort of educational background that may be required to really make sense of uh, what Ford is discussing here. And I'm not saying that it doesn't actually have a very valid and useful point to it. Just it was a little beyond me. But I love the history that was in here. Highly recommend it. It's not an expensive book. I don't remember the price offhand, uh, but it is currently in print. So if you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to a copy you can pick up on Amazon. And if it's a subject you're interested in, as always, this is definitely one that I would recommend. So, thanks for watching. Uh, tune in again next week for another book review. And of course, tomorrow we'll be back with a cool forgotten weapon. Thanks for watching.